Welcome to the United States Navy Memorial and welcome to the second in our series, our sit rep speaker series uh, here at the Navy Memorial. The mission of the Navy Memorial is to honor, recognize, and celebrate the men and women of the sea services, past, present, and future, and to inform the public about their service. This event is about that fourth verb in our mission, inform. We named this, this series sit rep after Navy situation reports, which are reports transmitted by commanding officers to their chain of command to inform them about an incident, and it provides context and the facts. The platform we're using today is Crowdcast. It provides the opportunity for you all to interact and engage in our event. As you can see on the screen, there's two opportunities for you to interact. One is to ask a question. If you open the box there on the bottom of the screen, you'll have the opportunity to type in a question. The second way is to click like. And if you like questions, the more people that like the question, it rotates to the top and it provides me the opportunity to know which questions most of you want to see. So we, before we go any farther, I'd like to thank our sponsors. We could literally not do what we do at the Navy Memorial without our sponsors. So thank you very much to Navy Mutual Aid Life Insurance, who has committed themselves to sponsor the series uh, for a whole year of sit reps. Thank you very much to Navy Mutual Aid. Today's specific event is sponsored by Lighthouse. You saw the video about Lighthouse, state-of-the-art company, uh, as we started. Additionally, Finn Cantieri is a co-sponsor for today's event. So thank you very much uh, to all of you who, who supported this event. We appreciate what you do for us so we can do what we do for the Navy. So our guest today literally needs no introduction to those of us who are naval enthusiasts who track the Navy on a, on a daily basis. As a matter of fact, I received several emails in response to our invitation saying, hey, when you see Hondo, tell him I said hello. Well, I hate to say it, but in the time of COVID, Secretary Gertz is actually over at the Pentagon and I'm here at the Navy Memorial and we're all practicing all the appropriate social distancing requirements that we have to do here in the time of COVID. So as you know, uh, Secretary Gertz uh, served in, in the Air Force uh, as an Air Force officer and has more than 30 years between the Air Force and as an acquisition professional in joint acquisition. His last assignment was at US SOCOM where he was responsible for the acquisition technology and logistics of all of the equipment at uh, Special Operations Command. He's been the Assistant Secretary of the Navy since 2017 and has literally gained himself a reputation for being a warfighter's warfighter. Well, I don't like to read biographies. I, am, I do want to read just a small phrase in the first sentence of his biography, his official biography, which says, he's responsible for equipping and supporting the finest sailors and Marines in the world with the best platform systems and technology as they operate around the globe in defense of the nation. That tells you a little bit about what he looks at for his job. So Secretary Gertz is joining us today by telephone. He will provide opening remarks and then we'll go to questions and answers. Ladies and gentlemen, Secretary Hondo Gertz. Kind of a couple main points for me starting out here is, uh, is one just, uh, you know, current events, are, are a stark reminder of the importance of a strong Navy. That's what we're all uh, trying to do here. Uh, and again, that's a team sport. And, uh, you know, a strong Navy ensures we have, uh, you know, the free and open marketplace worldwide uh, that, that we don't, uh, we can check aggression uh, at the shoreline and that we uh, have a robust information flow. And, and uh, one of the, the things I like to tell folks is the cloud is actually underwater. That's where that information is actually flowing, 99% of it around the world. And so, so, you know, it's really key that we've got this strong Navy and we all work together uh, to enable it. Part of the challenge we're, uh, we're working our way through, like everybody else, is COVID. I, I, I'm very proud of the Navy's uh, ability to continue to operate through COVID, both uh, operationally as well as in the back shop. Uh, here, we've actually been accelerating through the COVID crisis. Uh, if you look at, uh, you know, lots of different measures, if I look at uh, number, uh, dollars of contracts, uh, we have obligated, we've obligated at the end of June, $121 billion uh, already this year. That's up from about $89 billion a year before or $72 billion two years ago, the same point. And so it is interesting that we are, you know, not letting COVID itself uh, slow us down. The kind of three keys for me there are, are keeping a healthy workforce, 
Uh, that's both, uh, you know, at the uh, in all of our acquisition teams as well as in the shipyards and FRCs. Uh, we've been doing a good job. We have not closed uh, a single shipyard or FRC uh, through the crisis, so we've maintained uh, operations here. Uh, a strong industrial base, uh, making sure that we've got the work queued up. As I mentioned, we're about 33 to 37% ahead of plan. Uh, and what's interesting, we've done that with uh, less contract actions than uh, previously, so we're gaining efficiency there. And then it's all about readiness, ensuring that we're getting the ships in and out on time, airplanes in and out on time, uh, and uh, that activity. Um, where that leads us to is a you know a focus on the future, and ensuring as we come out of this uh, or as we continue to operate in COVID, we're not you know our site picture is not get back to where we were, but where we need to be. And so leveraging the efficiencies we've seen, the new partnerships we're seeing. Uh, the renewed sense of urgency uh, we're seeing um, so that we execute our programs uh, ruthlessly in the face of all these challenges. That is, we birth new programs like the Columbia and the Frigate. Uh, we're doing those uh, with high confidence and that we uh, keep our current readiness increasing and uh, driving costs down. And finally, um, really focusing on the future uh, so that we are going to be just as ready if not more ready 10 or 15 years from now as we are right now. All that base is, is, on, is on talent, and whether that's talent in uh, the contractor workforce, in the government workforce, uh, at the shipyards, in the FRC, so uh, spending a lot of time on talent uh, with an underlying principle of uh, equality and leveraging diversity uh, as our actual competitive advantage. And so uh, I'm sure we can uh, talk through some of the initiatives there, but but really focusing on building the talent we need uh, to compete and win uh, as we move forward here. So I think with that, Frank, I will uh, kind of stop with those interim uh, comments and, and happy to uh, discuss anything you and uh, folks out there in the audience would like to discuss. Uh, sounds great, Mr. Secretary. I think uh, we've got questions coming in. Um, before, we, uh, before I ask a, my first serious question, though, uh, first, I want to say thank you very much for your flexibility today as we work through the technical challenge. Um, but second of all, uh, on the lighthearted side, but maybe the serious side, you've, uh, you have an active role in social media, uh, specifically LinkedIn. And um, as a leader, you've been using that tool to communicate uh, with your team. And specifically, you've been uh, posting a song, and more importantly, uh, besides posting the song, You've been explaining why. So uh, can you share with us what you posted on LinkedIn, LinkedIn this morning, uh, what song and why you posted that song? Yeah, sure, great. I find, uh, you know, music is a, uh, is a great way to communicate across many different ways. And uh, I'm a little bit of a music freak, so uh, I'm, I'm uh, always listening to good tunes. And, uh, and I have found, you know, spending uh, over a decade at Special Operations Command, um, you know, I uh, have learned some about being in these long-term crises, uh, and one of them is you got to find lots of different ways to open up communication channels and keep people uh, kind of mission-focused. And so, yeah, today's, uh, today's song was from the record company called Off the Ground, so if you've listened to those lyrics, it talks about pick yourself off the ground and, you know, keep on moving forward. So. Uh, I thought that was a pretty good song for the day, and then uh, driving in, I, uh, I usually put uh, uh, spirit of the radio on from Rush to kind of get me pumped up for the day. So uh, you would have heard me blasting through the Pentagon with a uh, little Rush music uh, to get me motivated to uh, to do battle here on the uh, on the E ring. So I appreciate everybody supporting ideas in that. And if you got other good music ideas, send them uh, send them my way. Uh, sounds good. So let me get uh, let me go to the uh, to the serious side. Um, uh, and the current news side, before we uh, take it up a notch to, to your level and the strategy, uh, more the strategic level. So you, um, you traveled out to, uh, to San Diego on Friday uh, with, the, with the Chief of Naval Operations to visit the Bon Ham Richard. And uh, we all, we all uh, have been watching the news and, uh, and uh, our hearts uh, are out to the sailors and the civilians, the firefighters who have out, been out there doing their best. Um, so can, can you share with us uh, your observations? What'd you see, what'd you think, uh, w and what you can share with us about uh, what you took away from, the, from that visit? 
Yeah, I appreciate that, and it was uh, it was an honor to go out there with the, the CNO and, and get eyes on. Uh, many of us have been around for a while. You know, you get field reports all the time, uh, but nothing beats uh, getting eyes on there. Uh, and and I think uh, you know my perspective was both really get a sense of uh, uh, the ship and the ship condition, and uh, but more so uh, talking to individuals, understanding uh, their story. Uh, making sure we had all the right resources. I think the CNO kind of said it best, you know, when this first unfolded, you know, his concern was, you know, were the assets out there to do the work? And, and what I can tell you, um, if you had any uncertainty about the future generation, I wish everybody could go out there and uh, look folks in the eye out there, the folks who were running in, talk to a young sailor who, had, you know, she had gone in seven times, you know, some of the times it was, you know, so hot, so hot they could only be in, you know, 10 minutes at a time, couldn't see the person a foot in front of them, you know, a thousand degree heat. So uh, pretty remarkable uh, individual and collective effort. Uh, everybody uh, from the air wing out there to, to all the ships uh, in the port working together. Uh, ships uh, got a lot of damage, so, you know, our focus right now, now that we've kind of gotten everything safe, uh, is uh, doing the assessments on the ship and, and getting our knowledge together there, as well as collecting, uh, you know, any lessons learned uh, immediately and getting those out uh, to the folks that can use them. So, you know, fire is a, uh, a dangerous thing on a ship, and, uh, and that certainly was a uh, uh, largest fire that I can remember, certainly over the last couple of years. And so we want to make sure we can uh, do a proper assessment there, doing all the uh, investigations as you'd expect, uh, as well as then getting lessons learned out quickly to everybody. We're also, uh, the CNO, there was a 12-star letter went out to all the uh, ship commanders, uh, you know, charging them to redouble their efforts. Uh, we're doing the same thing on the private shipyard uh, and just, uh, you know, we're making sure that uh, we don't uh, have a follow-on incident uh, to this incident and that we uh, learn from it uh, from day one as we as we move forward. That's great, and and uh, I'd be remiss if I a without asking. There's probably not a lot to say about it, but I understand there was a small fire or a report of a fire on a Kearsarge this morning. Um, and uh, to your point, it sounds to me like Navy leadership is really focused on making sure we do the right thing, we do the assessments as we move forward. Yeah, I mean that was a uh, that was a very minor fire. It's the thing that you know we always have fire watches to take care of, but. Uh, it's also a constant reminder that threat is there, big and small. And so, you know, we took some action with the uh, contractor there to ensure that we had all the procedures, everything else right. And so, uh, while a minor uh, minor incident, uh, we didn't want to, uh, you know, we want to ensure that we've got all the procedures there. And so we're d we're redoubling across the force uh, to make sure we've got a, a keen eye on that. Great. So um, I've got some more some questions here to get into uh, with you as we uh, as we get uh, into the more strategic level and your job. I'm scrolling up. We got a lot of folks who uh, told us that uh, they didn't have the audio. I'm uh, I'm getting to uh, uh, the questions uh, that are are uh, more pertinent to you. And uh, for the audience out there, please uh, go ahead and ask your questions and vote and uh, like them, and they'll uh, float up to the top. Let me first start uh, with Naval X uh, because. Um, you've put uh, a lot of emphasis on Naval X uh, as a key part of, of your acquisition effort. So could you give us kind of a, a layman's term, a non-acquisition explanation of Naval X and, uh, and tell me, uh, tell us about that initiative and, uh, and how you think that's going to bear fruit? Yeah, so one of the, uh, you know, one of the things that really impressed me, you know, having been a guy in the Joint Force uh, all over, you know, I always admire the Navy's uh, they held on to their uh, technical talent and really valued technical talent. Uh, and, uh, you know, held on to the warfare centers and the systems commands. Um, but one of the things I noticed coming here, particularly from my SOCOM experience, was that technical talent wasn't always linked together uh, and that it was not always clear if you were a sailor or a Marine that had an issue or you were a contractor that might have an idea or maybe you're a shipyard that's looking for a piece of technology wandering your way through all these syscoms and warfare centers and all that to find the person you talk to uh, was pretty darn onerous and, and likely a barrier uh, to achieving the velocity I was looking for. 
And so you can think of Naval X as just a way to connect up our own network. Uh, and so that we can operate at network speed across the Department of the Navy. Uh, and uh, these guys, I think, uh, guys and gals, are, are really super connectors uh, that can quickly figure out how to uh, connect people up, uh, look for opportunities, and get those opportunities in the hands of the right folks. So if you think of Naval X as the network, uh, so that we don't, you know, the fastest way to... Uh, to learn something is to steal it from somebody who's already solved the problem, right? Yeah. Um, then what we're doing now is adding these things we call tech bridges. Think of those as nodes on the networks, whether they're fleet concentration areas or, or warfare centers. Uh, and these are just, again, easy collection points. We had a lot of different activities, say, going on at Newport, um, but it wasn't um, uh, synchronized in a, in a in a way, so we were being a little inefficient in our spend and really making it difficult. And so this is really all about working at network speed and, and collecting up, uh, connecting a problem, uh, a person who has a problem with somebody who may have a solution and vice versa. It's also a way to kind of increase our surface area. Uh, so if you're out there in industry, you know, the Navy had one of its largest small business years last year over $16 billion went directly to small business. If you don't know the Navy well or you're a non-traditional player, uh, you're not going to spend nine months trying to figure out who to talk to if it's too, too tough. So the other thing this does is, is really try and reduce the barrier uh, to entry for uh, participations to, participants to bring us uh, new solutions or new ideas. So you talk about tech bridges, and, and I, I think I understand them, but, but for the for the, the folks out there watching, um, can you give us some examples of the tech bridges? Yeah, so, um, so you can think of down, say, in Orlando, where we've got training systems. Uh, so that's a pretty vibrant ecosystem with training systems. The other services are down there. Uh, there's academic uh, activities going on at University of Central Florida. Uh, we've got uh, a warfare center down there. Uh, and so this would be, uh, again, uh, the Navy is kind of, I think it's the first time we've ever had a partnership intermediary agreement with all four services on it as a way to get, again, kind of create that. You can almost think of it as a cluster of, you know, uh, of expertise. Uh, it's not unlike what you see in certain startup clusters around the country. Uh, so it's just kind of aligning all of our activity, whether it's STEM activity or our early uh, science and technology uh, small business innovator, innovative research, or solving fleet problems. It just gives you a one-stop shop. So think of it as, a, you know, the kind of one-stop shop to get onto the network. Each of those tech bridges and kind of through Naval X are connected uh, so that they can leverage each other. And we're up to 12 of those tech bridges now uh, across the Department of the Navy. And it's amazing what they're doing to uh, kind of speed up um, our, our, uh, our velocity as well as enable uh, new players to come into our uh, ecosystem. So it sounds to me like you're focused on culture. Um, the culture and the acquisition community, the, as a matter of fact, the whole RDNA community. Um, can you touch on, on how that fits and maybe take it up a level as to the, where you're trying to take the culture of the community? So in my experience throughout my career is anytime you can close down the distance between end user, uh, provider, technologist, right? You get better speed and a better solution at a cheaper price. Uh, and and you know, SOCOM uh, obviously is a prime example of, of this. Uh, the Navy's got it in bits and pieces, uh, but we're really trying to double down on that. How do we bring everybody to bear in an integrated fashion to take on a problem versus what I would call a traditional bureaucratic transactional process. So, you know, some folks get together and they have a need and then other folks, they hand it off to folks to write a requirement, who then hand it off to folks to get money, who then hand it off to folks to do an acquisition solution, who then hand it off to folks to field and train on it. That kind of serial transactional process is inherently inefficient and not uh, dynamic and responsive. Uh, particularly with current threats. So, so this real culture is whether it's at the secretary at OPNAV level all the way down to 
you know, I've got squadron commanders sending me notes thanking me for a program manager who met directly with them and went off and solved a problem on an F-18. Uh, or or a, a naval shipyard who needed a piece of technology to reduce sustainment costs and got it from a warfare center uh, with money from ONR. That's to me what right looks like, you know, where somebody's got a great idea, can walk it in the door and we can immediately go uh, capitalize on that opportunity. If we're going to kind of compete at the global scale, it's not going to be on very, you know, it's not going to succeed with bureaucratic transactional processes. So you talk about competing on the global scale, um, and uh, and clearly, I think uh, from what I'm hearing uh, out there, there's clearly changes in the culture. So uh, slightly different direction now. The four pillars. So uh, once you once the culture is in place, uh, which clearly I think the need for change and uh, was recognized, and and you've taken advantage of that, can you talk about the four pillars of, of how you intend to use that culture and where you're focused uh, on these four pillars that you've created? Yeah, I mean, and, you know, if anything's taught me, uh, uh, you know, all the scar tissue all my life, it's been uh, you got to focus on delivery. Right, and delivery doesn't mean just that from new construction, it could be delivery of ships out of shipyards and you know, delivering sustainment. Uh, but you can't focus on a process, you've got to focus on outcomes and outputs. And so kind of that first, that first kind of pillar for me is, right, we've got to deliver and sustain lethal capacity. Anything that we're doing that isn't helping us do that better, faster, more effectively uh, is, uh, you know, our barnacles, we just need to scrape off uh, and let's sink to the bottom of the ocean. And so that kind of hyper focus on output and outcomes, I think, uh, then starts aligning activity to a more integrated uh, fashion than a transactional one, right? Once you've kind of that, got that done, then you become opportunistic, and right then you can get your pivot speed up. Because if you're all working together, you can maybe see opportunities that uh, weren't seen before, or you can capture on a, uh, on an opportunity, it presents itself. And so if you focus on outcomes, then you get your pivot speed up, then you can really uh, drive portability into the system and, uh, and reduce kind of fundamental cost. And, and underlying all that is, is having the talent uh, in, in house and, and growing, right? And, and if you're gonna have talent You've got to present a culture that values everyone equally, that leverages diversity as a competitive advantage, right? And again, focuses on the, uh, what does that individual bring to this to the table? One of the things, you mentioned music up front. One of the things I loved about the band this, this morning was that they're very vocal about how each one of them is much more talented playing as part of the band than individually. And the band's sound, sound is all about the three of them playing, not about each individually. That's you know that's where we've got to continue to drive towards. Yeah. So so that takes you to the people part, and uh, and maybe if I could split the 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 next three questions up into shipyards, uh, uh, the the public shipyards, the private shipyards, and and small business. Um, so you've, I think, recently traveled out to see the shipyards. I think you went out with the Secretary of the Navy. Um, so from the people's standpoint, um, how are the, the public shipyards doing? How's the productivity going? I mean, so you've got this culture, you've got Naval X, you're creating these tech bridges, then you get handed COVID. Um, and so how are we doing today in the shipyards and, and uh, the efficiency, the output, uh, and just how the people doing uh, amongst these uh, crazy conditions that we find ourselves in in COVID? Yeah, great question. And again, so I think at some point somebody, uh, it would be a great story to write about whether it's public or private shipyards, how in the face of all of this, uh, we kept the shipyards open and didn't shut down. You know, hundreds of thousands of people on the, in the shipyards and uh, they've been able to continue to operate, uh, continue to uh, repair, sustain, and produce these new ships. So, you know, I'm very proud of uh, that workforce, uh, whether it's uh, public side or private, and equally as, uh, as so on the on the FRC uh, side of things. Uh, we have had um, some challenges with productivity. We were uh, rightly, I think, focused on uh, uh, being conservative a little bit on uh, workforce health as we came into COVID. 
Um, that understanding, you know, trying to figure out how to process the CDC guidelines in a way that uh, kept everybody safe in the shipyards. We've kind of worked our way through that. And so the, the workforce is up. We, uh, we leveraged some uh, new tools in our tool chest, uh, you know, uh, activating, I think, the largest uh, reserve activation since 9-11. Uh, so 1,600 reservists we've activated to help in the shipyards. Uh, uh, we've brought in a number of other uh, contractors to support. So everybody's kind of rallying together to, uh, to bring this in. You know, when I look at our shipyards, um, we've got a kind of a gener generational changeover. You know, over 50% of them have less than five years experience. Uh, while that presents some risk, I actually think it provides some great uh, opportunity. Uh, because as we get that workforce trained and up and uh, operating, um, we're going to have them for the for the long haul here, which I think will uh, allow us to continue to work forward. Um, we've got you know we've got work to do to give them world class facilities. We're working on that. Uh, we've got work to do to bring kind of modern, um, data driven kind of approaches uh, to help them uh, achieve efficiency, uh, and that's underway. So I think the future is bright. Uh, COVID is certainly uh, galvanizing uh, our resolve early to get after it, and uh, we're just going to have to stay on top of it. So uh, stay, in, stay in there, because uh, you mentioned something that I, that I think uh, is very interesting to the, to the folks uh, who are listening. Um, 1,600 reservists at the public shipyard. So we think of the public shipyards uh, as pre pre predominantly uh, civilian workforce. Um, how, how is that working? Uh, wh wh what is happening there with 1,600 reservists being uh, uh, on call to augment the shipyards? What, what's going on there? Yeah, so I think we're still early in it. You know, we are bringing them on in a phased manner and, you know, uh, working closely with the individuals so we don't, you know, create, uh, to solve one crisis, create a, create a new crisis. Uh, and so we've had the first kind of, uh, you know, in the hundreds starting to show up. Uh, so we're early, but I, you know, I'm, I'm very comfortable. We're, we've got a very mission-focused organization. Uh, the shipyards are proud of getting ships out to uh, support the fleet. So, uh, you know, I, I talk about kind of my three lines of effort in COVID. You know, I keep the workforce healthy, keep the industrial base healthy, I keep ships ready. Uh, you know, the operational tempo has not slowed down. Uh, the operational demand, you know, if you read how many carriers we've got operating around the world, uh, and so, you know, the operational tempo didn't take a COVID break. So we're going to employ all of these different uh, levers we have uh, to keep those ships going out there and supporting our sailors and Marines. Uh, they can't slow down, so we can't slow down. Thanks. So that's, a, that's a great story uh, for, for force integration there. Um, so to the industrial base and the, and the larger uh, contractors, um, they've also been handled the challenge, just as you've kind of been stabilizing the, uh, uh, the contracting process and the predictability uh, for uh, the large defense contractors you get faced with COVID. Um, how are they doing uh, in general? Uh, and I think we'd be really interested in, in hearing how that uh, coordination is going uh, with uh, the, the biggest part, the bigger part of the industrial base, um, as well as, as your thoughts on how do we ensure they have the resources, uh, the financial resources, as well as the, the planning resources to be able to go forward as we, uh, as we battle through COVID? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I would say that we're working this on a couple different uh, uh, avenues of approach. And, and, uh, and again, I, uh, I applaud the uh, defense industrial base um, for their ability to continue to work through the crisis. Uh, in the face of uh, you know all these challenges, what I thought was really important is, as we hit the initial piece um, was to ensure that we uh, we could keep the financials flowing. Uh, and so we very very early on, and everybody should be proud, I think, of the Navy's fast response uh, in the face of the crisis here uh, from a couple different perspectives. Initially. Um, you know, we worked very hard to get any of the money we had in the system for money for work that had been performed, but we had not yet built out into the system. You know, and that was a, uh, you know, almost an immediate infusion of, uh, you know, nearly a billion dollars of just work in progress payments or withholds or things that, uh, you know, for a bunch of number of reasons, 
uh, had not been paid out yet. Normally, that's not a big deal when you've kind of got, you know, things are operating as normal. Uh, but that gave an immediate kind of cash boost that went through the supply chain. And then we moved, as I spoke about, aggressively to, to line up and award uh, future work. Because wanted, what I wanted to do was ensure uh, there was no uncertainty of the future work we had. And if we could award it uh, earlier, as you know, we're, like I said, up about you know, over a, a third higher than normal, $30 billion to monetize it uh, in the system, that would allow then, what I didn't want to do is lose contractors, uh, second and third and fourth uh, tier suppliers, uh, because they weren't sure if the next order was coming. Uh, and so, so that kind of got us, uh, you know, through and stabilized uh, everything and kept uh, work going. Our, our effort right now is really understanding what the impact is with COVID with some lost productivity, uh, and then how do we uh, deal with that programmatically and deal with that financially. And, and uh, you know, there's been a lot, of, you probably saw letters to the Hill uh, regarding the need for supplemental funds to deal with the cost impacts of COVID from the defense base. We're working through those details right now. Uh, but they've been great partnership. I meet uh, every Friday with a number of the largest CEOs and we compare notes. Uh, one thing I'd also, I, you know, I'd be remiss without giving a shout out. I'm, you know, meet weekly with the shipyard presence. Uh, there has been no barrier to them uh, sharing best practices in terms of uh, workforce, uh, health and safety, uh, and, uh, and how to keep operations running but safe. Uh, I have not seen any uh, example where um, any of the shipyards, if they came up with a new solution, uh, didn't quickly uh, promote across the whole uh, industry base. And so I applaud them for that. You know, they're very competitive in many arenas. Uh, keeping workers safe was not one. Uh, and that's really helped us, I think, uh, keep our operations going. That's great to hear. So let's go to the third the third part of that, the small businesses. You mentioned $16 billion. Um, I can't imagine being a small business uh, already trying to operate in the complexities of, uh, of the DOD acquisition world. Uh, but you've clearly put some emphasis on, um, on helping them be uh, uh, successful and a part of the acquisition uh, uh, plan. So can you touch on what you're doing with small businesses and, and perhaps any advice for them as, as, uh, as we move forward uh, to be a better part of your, uh, your acquisition program? Yeah, I mean, again, part of, uh, you know, part of, I think, part of my uh, strategy, right, is differentiating work and making sure, you know, what works for one part of the sector may not be what works for another part. That's certainly the case. Now, part of dealing with big business and getting that kind of cash flow and work order in the big businesses, part of my requirement with them was anything I give them needs to flow down in kind through the through supply base. So a lot of trying to stabilize the supply base and small businesses that support our bigger programs kind of through those big contracts. Secondly, we are, uh, you know, doubling the number of silver awards kind of over the uh, uh, next, uh, you know, we're about halfway through the 90-day period uh, and looking anywhere where we can accelerate awards uh, and looking at all of our kind of non-traditional suppliers or early stage suppliers to understand their particular stories. You know, do they need uh, support through uh, us helping broker one of the uh, COVID loans? Is it uh, that we need to look at awarding a super contract early? Um, we're using new processes like virtual industry days. So I'm, I work for a small business waiting to come on active duty. I know that, you know, live the dream of cash flow and, you know, you've got to pick which industry day to go to out of five because you can't afford to fly everybody around. So COVID is actually allowing us to come up with new processes which allow much greater participation in these industry days and some of these other sessions because uh, we can do it all virtually now uh, versus having everybody fly around. And so, uh, we're looking at you know all these different kind of ideas of how to ensure we keep our keep small businesses uh, um, solvent and that we uh, that are there as we need them going forward. They are you know they are a key lever of our uh, innovation and pivot speed, and so you know we've got to be very sensitive, uh, particularly to cash flow with them, uh, uh, particularly in this time right now. So. Uh Interesting point, especially you uh, you bring up the uh, the, the uh, supply chain. We have a question here uh, from Tom Church online. So, 
I'm going to start going to some of the questions here in the uh, program. If you have a question, uh, uh, please go ahead into the, uh, the program. You'll see the block on the, uh, on the bottom. Tap that if you have a question. And if there's a question you particularly like, hit the uh, like button, and the system will float that question up to the top and, uh, and hopefully get above Jeff Davis's comment that there was no audio back in the beginning. Um, so there's a question here from Tom Church about uh, the supply base and uh, um, the supply chain, actually. And, uh, and so he, he touches on China, but, but if I could broaden uh, Admiral Church's question out a little bit, um, the supply chain, how it's been affected both COVID and then uh, I think Admiral Church wants to touch also on uh, on the Chinese part of that. Yeah, so we had already, you know, one of the things when I first came to the Navy, I was, um, I was not satisfied that we had done enough work understanding our supply chain, understanding our ability to surge for wartime, and, and quite frankly, uh, treat acquisition as a war fighting function. So we had started up a, a kind of a wartime support, you know, again, some of my SOCOM experience was right if you if the first time you think about acting in a wartime mode in wartime it's going to be really tough uh, and so we had already started doing a number of uh, activities uh, understanding of supply chain understanding where we had uh, fragility or an ability to accelerate uh, that thinking and the processes and tools we put in place have really helped us kind of pivot uh, to this COVID activity in fact we use a lot of the same models and and put them together with kind of COVID models to understand as suppliers were coming and going where we'd see impacts. So I think COVID is just kind of, you know, re-amplified in my mind, the nature to really understand your supply chain, really understand its fragility uh, and plan, you know, and have fallback plans before you need them. Um, you know, when I talk about where we want to come out of COVID, I don't want to go back to a hyper-efficient, highly coupled supply chain uh, that doesn't have much resiliency. Um, we're leveraging, you know, to the tune of $100 million plus of uh, Defense Production Act funds. Uh, also trying to, to bolster supply chain as well as uh, gotten great support from Congress on how to uh, improve our supply chain. So that's certainly a focus that we're going to continue to uh, to look for opportunities there. Uh, great. Did you want to touch anything on the, the China part of the supply chain? Well, I think that's just resilience, you know. Mm -hmm. If you don't understand your supply chain, then uh, you know you're not going to complete. You're not going to compete at a global level. And if you don't understand where you've given your competitor an opportunity to negatively impact you, uh, then you're going to find out the hard way. So, you know, we're certainly looking at that. We're uh, we're also tracking a little less supply chain, maybe it's supply chain, but in uh, future technology, watching closely what I'll call adversarial capital. And, uh, and ensuring that for the key technologies and areas where uh, we need to have capability, ensuring that um, our competitors are not using capital in a way that will erode our capability for the future. Hmm. So you mentioned uh, congressional action back in the first part of the COVID and the supply chain comment. Um, and uh, recognizing you're working closely with, uh, with the folks on the Hill and Congress, um, quite, we have a question in from Art Clark here. Um, so, you know, and it's interesting, he points out that, that you've noted that the business of the Navy continues. And uh, the question is, do you foresee some legislative action um, that will streamline the acquisition process going forward based on what we've learned here in the last couple months? Yeah, I guess my, um, my take was most of our challenges are self-inflicted and culturally reinforced. Um, and so, you know, I've said this in hearings, I don't think Congress is the thing that slows, that creates barriers we can't overcome. There are certainly areas where we've got to, you know, work more closely with the Hill and make sure, you know, we're synchronized on our uh, future plans, uh, you know, like on unmanned systems, there's a, you know, we've got to continue to work closely with our counterparts on the Hill to make sure we've got that strategy right. But. In terms of acquisition speed and, uh, and our resilience, um, it's not really as much a congressional issue as ensuring we take the lessons learned out of COVID and apply them. And so if I look at COVID, we're, we're, you know, we're $30 billion plus ahead on contract awards with a workforce that's you know 80% plus teleworking. 
uh, in the midst of COVID. So, you know, our goal is capture, which is allowing us to speed up in this disruption and then make that our normal course of business uh, to both get us speed and resilience. Um, 90, none of that, I think, relies on congressional support. Uh, that's just us continuing to, uh, to uh, you know, use those um, kind of four Ds I've talked about, right? decentralize, differential work, digitize it, and develop talent uh, to its full course. Uh, and so uh, I don't want to blame Congress uh, for our inability to move out. Uh, we've got plenty to work on on our own. Yeah, so uh, I mentioned Congress, and that fits it right into a question we have uh, online here from Paul Ryan. Um, and I'll, I'll first kind of set up the question with a little bit of uh, uh, discussion about uh, unmanned surface vehicles. So last week, the Navy uh, uh, led a contract for a prototype. Um, it seems, I won't answer the question, but it, but it looks like a possibility to leverage a prototype here. And, uh, and Paul Ryan's question is that, uh, he says the Congress doesn't seem to like the Navy plan for USVs. Uh, where are we heading with USV and UUV procurement? And that if we could focus on the general question, but also the specific part, how do you, how do you see being able to use this prototype uh, in this contract that seems somewhat of a unique vehicle you've created here uh, going forward in the unmanned vehicle uh, in arena? Yeah, so I think, again, we've got to work closely with the Hill to give them confidence. You know, their concern is, uh, uh, you know, we're moving out too quickly without having, uh, you know, kind of all the technology. I mean, again, there's, I, I'm paraphrasing kind of the key, some, some of the language, and certainly I'm not speaking for all of Congress, but, you know, a key, key that came out of the SAS language uh, and, and all the committees is a concern. Do we have our arms around the technology? Um, or do we uh, understand all the, you know, the prototyping necessary to have high confidence in the technology? And we'll work that um, with the Hill and ensure that we come, you know, that, that we've got full transparency of what we're doing and uh, work closely with them. Uh, from my perspective, the biggest challenge in the unmanned arena is not the technology per se. Uh, there's certainly some technology elements to work on. It's really the, con the concept of operations, the command and control, the concept of employment. And so I do think there is a balance we've got to strike with getting some prototypes out to the field uh, so that the, uh, the fleet can understand how to best utilize uh, what's available. We've got to balance that with prudent discipline uh, programmatics, uh, and that's the, uh, the balance we're working to uh, uh, put together right now, and, and we'll continue to work closely with Congress on it. You know, so I think these early prototypes are extremely valuable because um, we've got to understand how to operate these systems in a way that will make sense. If I go back to my, you know, SOCOM um, experience, you know, early on in the, in the war in Afghanistan and Iraq, we had UAVs. We weren't quite uh, certain how to use them to their full uh, advantage. And so, you know, we always had this combination of get them out there early enough to understand the opportunities they present, uh, but not so early that they're not... Um, you know, trustworthy uh, on the battlefield. We've got to find that same balance, I think, on the unmanned uh, surface vehicle side. So in the, in the big picture there, uh, the word balance and, and, um, and uh, my words, you know, not allowing us to be burdened by our own impediments. Um, question here about uh, the use of other transaction authority um, and uh, your openness to use OTAs uh, in order to, to uh, better the process. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think OTAs are wonderful, OTAs are wonderful tools. The Navy, uh, I think sometimes the Navy, um, if you look at the data, it can be a little bit misleading sometimes because in my mind, if another service already has an OTA vehicle, uh, we don't need to write one just to have a Navy one. We can leverage their vehicle. So, you know, um, buy a ticket on the railroad, not build, you know, have to build all the railroads yourself. Mm -hmm. um, I think the big challenge um, for the entire DOD is really understanding how to use the OTA for their unique advantage. Uh, sometimes I see us write OTA, we call them OTAs, but they look just like far based contracts, mm -hmm. uh, but we call them commercial contracts. So I don't think we've fully exploited the opportunities to really uh, use them to their full extent. That requires some training, that requires sharing best practices. And you know, we talked about Naval X previously. One of the things Naval X does is build playbooks. 
uh, and across the community shares best practices and who's doing what. One of the first ones was OTA playbooks so that you know everybody can learn with the best experience we have somewhere else and not have to learn it all themselves. Uh, so I think there's still uh, a lot more opportunity there. Uh, again, I want to make sure we're using OTAs for their unique um, attributes and you need uh, use them in that way, not just, you know, write a commercial contract that just is a far based contract by another name. Yeah. Thank you. So let me uh, let me ask one more question, and then, uh, Mr. Secretary, I'm going to ask you for uh, closing remarks as we wind down towards four o'clock. I'm going to total, totally shift course on you because uh, one thing that prior to this people were asking me about is is your thoughts on the on the USS Ford and the Ford class carrier. Um, uh, my experience in the Navy is every new class of ship uh, has a challenge, and the bigger the stretch in technology, the bigger the challenge. Um, but you we've recently uh, done a change in program manager. It's been in the news for about a year. Can you give us a, a straight up appraisal of where we are here in, uh, on July 20th with USS Ford? Big picture thoughts, where are we today and where are we going forward? Yeah, good, thanks for the opportunity. Um, you know, what I, would, I wish everybody who, who had an opportunity and unfortunately COVID makes it tough, could actually get out on the Ford and talk to sailors. Because no matter what I would say, uh, it doesn't really matter. It kind of matters what the sailors think. And if I think you could talk to the sailors, uh, you'd maybe get a different impression than maybe what you see in uh, in some of the more uh, traditional news reporting. Hey, it's a big program. We haven't built a new carrier in 40 years, and being first in anything is tough. And then when you add, you know, decisions made way back when uh, to put a whole bunch of technology together, that makes it tough. Uh, what I can tell you, you know, since I got here in 2017, you know, when I first got here. Uh, you know, we had not done, uh, you know, flight ops. We were, you know, struggling to get basic systems running. Uh, you go out there right now, it's, uh, you know, in the nine months it's been doing kind of its deployment since PSA, um, they've had a 500% increase in cats and traps. They're up to like almost 3,500 cats and traps. Uh, that ship is the most heavily deployed ship, I believe, right now, uh, aircraft carrier in the Navy. It's out on 50% of the time. It's doing all the qualifications for all of our new uh, carrier pilots. Uh, so we've got uh, naval aviators. The first deck they land on is the USS Ford. Uh, and if you went out there, uh, you'd see some folks very proud of what they're doing. We've got to, you know, we're in that, you know, first of anything. So you've got to get equipment uh, reliable. You've got to get procedures done. You've got to get training uh, and uh, maintenance training done. You've got to have all the right parts. So we're we're doing all that learning, but. You know, I'm pretty darn proud of the activity out there, and, and I think anybody who could get out on the ship uh, would see it. We've got a couple of things we're still uh, we're still working our way through. And, you know, elevators gets lots of attention. We're about ready to turn over uh, the second lower elevator, so that now gives them uh, access to the Ford magazine. Uh, they've already got access to the app magazine. So now the ship can start, you know, that's the last kind of piece so it can do all its kind of cyclic ops. We've had the air wing deployed out there. Uh, and so we'll continue to learn. Uh, you know, my, my uh, commitment's always been be, be very transparent uh, and let folks know what's going on. Uh, I didn't think we had necessarily the right leadership at the program manager level to take us for the next level. We got a lot of work coming up. Uh, and, and so uh, uh, as any good leader would, you wanna make sure we get the right uh, folks for the task coming forward and so uh, you know I'm pretty confident that we've got the right team in there they got the right focus uh, and that ships out there uh, grinding away it'll be back out to sea here pretty quickly and uh, I think you'll continue to see uh, progress uh, but it's hard work I don't want to I don't want to you know candy coat it it's hard work every day and very proud of, uh, of what they're accomplishing Thank you. What a what a great uh, last answer. But let me uh, give you some time. Uh, anything you want to go back to or uh, closing remarks uh, before we wrap it up, Mr. Secretary? No. I, again, I apologize for the uh, for the lack of video and uh, an audio challenge. I'm sure it's uh, on our side here, and so uh, on the Pentagon strikes again. But I do appreciate the opportunity to uh, to at least speak with everybody here. Um, I am exceedingly proud of what our combined industry, academia, uh, government, uh, sailor, marine team is doing. Um, we've certainly got challenges, but if you look at what everybody's doing on a day in and day out job, 
while supporting a Navy that's you know heavily operationally deployed, it's uh, uh, it's impressive. But we can't rest on that. Uh, we've got more challenges to come. Um, I think uh, anybody who knows me knows, uh, you know, again, I'm not going to candy coat it, uh, but if we all kind of stay mission focused, uh, we call it like we see it, we are, uh, we are aggressive uh, yet disciplined, um, then I think we will continue to be the, uh, the tip of the sphere as we get into this uh, uh, kind of global competition. Uh, and you should all be proud of how hard everybody's working. There are certainly challenges. Uh, and we don't we don't want to downplay those, but don't let those consume everybody uh, as as we look forward. Uh, and all I have to do is point towards you know one of the only organizations I've seen that is accelerating its performance uh, in the midst of a uh, global pandemic. Uh, that doesn't uh, that doesn't happen without a lot of hard work uh, by everybody in the enterprise. And so uh, I am I'm exceedingly proud of that. And I think we can use that as a uh, continued pivot point as we uh, prepare for the challenges ahead, of which I expect there will be many. So thank you very much. What a great way to close. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for giving us a sit rep. Uh, and thank you for, for doing what you're doing for uh, uh, the sailors and Marines of today. And, and uh, perhaps more importantly, even though that's so important for the sailors and Marines tomorrow, uh, we appreciate everything you're doing for us. So uh, thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. All right, Admiral Thor, thanks. Thanks, everybody out there. Have a great Navy day. All right, thank you. So tune in uh, for our next sit rep. Um, we'll get the technology challenges uh, solved, uh, much like the Ford aircraft carrier, uh, Ford class, we'll get them solved. Uh, we've got the Navy's Chief of Person Navy Personnel, Chief of Naval Personnel coming up next month. Uh, we'll be sending out that invitation uh, shortly. Um, I'd also like just to thank you all for, uh, for tuning in and for your interest uh, in our sea services. Uh, it's people like you uh, is why this organization exists, is to honor, recognize, and celebrate uh, the men and women of the sea services and keep them informed. And uh, finally, I'd also like to thank our event sponsor again, Lighthouse. Uh, thank you very much. And thank our co-sponsor, Finn Cantieri. And finally, our series co-sponsor, Navy Mutual Aid. And, uh, and we'll end with an, uh, an upbeat thought uh, from Navy Mutual Aid Life Insurance. Thank you very much. Most of us want to leave something for those we leave behind. It's a beautiful sacrifice that people make. This is our opportunity to give back to the men and women who do so much for us. Trust at Navy Mutual is, is essential. Trust is everything. Trust is the centerpiece of what we do here at Navy Mutual. We've been doing it for 130 plus years.